Hey, we're in a series on Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1, if you would, please. And there was a conversation that I read recently between two parents. Uh, Parent number one said this, I'm so glad Christmas break is over. I hate having the kids around all the time. Parent two said, really, I love having the kids around all the time, and I get sad when school starts. And I would add, said, no teacher ever, right? Um, You know, I have a teacher in my house, and the school starts, her life ends, and so does mine in a way, right? So it's, uh, uh, but today we're going to be talking a little bit about, uh, a little bit about parenting, and we're going to be talking a little bit about how to parent. Now, you might say, I'm single, Uh, what's this have to do with me? Well, you may be single, but uh, you were parented. And sometimes when you're parented, I'm parented, our view of God and how we think of the world and how we think of others is shaped. Uh, So this has to do with you. Some of you are parents, some of you are grandparents, some of you are caregivers, some of you have uh, nephews and nieces that you're trying to pour into their lives. So, uh, So this message is for you because we as a church, we want to pour into children's lives. Amen? Uh, here's the main point of the sermon. You can either endure or enjoy your children, and I believe God wants you to enjoy them. Children are a gift. Life is sacred. Every little kid that's running around this property today is a gift. Uh, you know, we need to know that as a church because sometimes... Uh, We see kids running around, and they put their hands like all over the walls, and there's fingerprints everywhere. Uh, I always put it to you like this. Um, I'm happy to see those fingerprints. Better to see fingerprints on the wall than no children around the church. That would be a real problem, massive problem. We as a church, we need to be aware, man. I want lots and lots of little kids around here. I want to see them grow up in Christ. I want to see parents have joy. And uh, this is what, what I think church should be about. We're not all about entertaining. Uh, there's, a, there's a, you know, we do things to entertain your kids. We have to, else we would go crazy. Uh, but we are also into teaching them truth about Jesus. That's what you should be. You shouldn't be just like, oh, life's a party. We're going to have all this fun. No, it's about teaching. It's about training. It's about pointing them to Jesus. It's about helping them shape answers in their lives to ultimate questions that they need to know about the existence of God. That's all part of it. And uh, we as a church, it's not just like, you know, you got your kids and I'm over here and, you know, you don't talk to my kids and I don't talk to your kids. No, it isn't that at all. We, we should all be together helping shape and encourage and build each other up. And so even though you may not have children, you know, there are lots of children around here for you to pour into. And uh, our children's ministry would be delighted if 50 of you right now would go say, I'm so convicted by that message, I want to serve children. And uh, you go see our children's ministry director, Liz, and uh, afterwards, because, man, children are important. Children are a gift. We should be investing. We should be investing in children. You know, sometimes churches get this all wrong, and uh, I've seen Christians get this all wrong. How do we get it wrong Uh, Here's one way we get it wrong, where uh, we really come to the conclusion we start majoring on minors, and we drive children out of the church. They don't feel welcome. We drive teens out of the church. They don't feel like they're a part of the body. They don't feel wanted. They don't feel necessary. We major on minors. Now, I'm going to get myself in more trouble probably today, uh, but I'm game, all right? Uh, How do we major on minors? Here's one way, like, when we, uh, when we focus too much on things like corporate worship dress. Like, in other words, if you don't dress a certain way, you're not welcome here. You know, those of you, some of you just have kids smaller. Some of you have grandkids and older children. And uh, you know, I'm not trying to throw shade on you, you know like you would do anything to have them in church today. Like, this is a heart. This is your heart. This is what you desire and uh, you bring them, you don't want anybody majoring on the minors when they walk in the door. You don't want anybody looking them from top to bottom saying, why are you wearing X? Uh, You're just happy that they're there and they're under the sound of the gospel. 
And uh, so I would encourage all of us, myself included, you know, let's not, uh, let's not major on the minors because... Psalm 127, verse 3 says, Sons, it really means children, are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a gift. Now, we're in a series of Proverbs, but, but this is a good, this is almost reads like a proverb. Children are a gift. They are a heritage from the Lord. And uh, we've got to be careful what we're depositing into those little minds and how we're treating those little lives And uh, it's not just you as parents, it's us as a church. We have to be very careful and cautious and cognizant because we want lots of children. We want to see them grow up in the Lord. We don't want to see them stray. So uh, not too many illustrations today about Pam. I've already burnt that bridge uh, last week. And uh, now it's on my kids. And uh, here they go. They're going to hear a lot today. Uh, Two kids. So, you know, it's not, you're not a genius to figure out which one is which one here and what they've done, all right? But uh, two kids, uh, one of my kids, uh, believe it or not, uh, growing up in my home, in church, like three times a week, in uh, Christian school every day, one of my kids uh, wanted nothing to do with Jesus growing up. And I would talk to them and I'd say, hey, uh, where are you with Jesus? Can I, can I talk to you about Christ? They'd be like, uh, not interested, not interested. And they gave me that look like, get out of my room. Uh, Don't be preaching at me. I don't want any part of it. And, And I remember those days, like those were tough days on me, but I remember the day that they came to faith in Christ. All the prayers, all the teaching, all the effort, when they turned to Christ and said, I'm planting my flag with Jesus. I mean, the angels were rejoicing and a mom and dad were rejoicing, amen? You, you, some of you know what that's like. There was great, great, great rejoicing. So that's kid one. Now remember, these are pastor kids, right? God help them, all right? Um, that's kid number one. Kid number two, same thing, growing up, growing up in church, reading the Bible, loving Jesus, uh, doing everything we knew that that was possible in their life. And uh, then after they went through a season, they decided, I no longer believe in God. Like, I'm done with God. I don't want any parts of God. Well, that was hard to take. So my nature is to kind of, you know, press in on them. And and I decided I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't going to press in on them. Uh, I was going to let them be. And I was going to pray like crazy, point them to Jesus, and let them figure it out on their own. And so uh, they started doing that. They started thinking, because they're a good thinker. Uh, They get that from their mom. Uh, They're a really good thinker. And, you know, I started praying and seeking God. And And then slowly, like after like nine months, things were like real bad. I'm like, they, like they were off the grid. They were, they were doing things they shouldn't have been doing. And I was like, you know, swallowing hard. Uh, what is going on here? And uh, I started seeing things. Like one day I came downstairs, uh, down to our lower level, and I noticed there, there was a theology book that was open. So here's someone who doesn't believe in God. They just told me that. Now they're reading theology. So uh, you might say, what's theology? It's the study of God. It's how it all fits together. So, some of you should start reading some theology. It would, it would bolster your faith. And so they're reading theology, and I'm like, okay, something's going on here. And then I follow them on Instagram, obviously, and uh, I noticed they started posting things on IG, and I was like, oh, okay, this is positive. And so, uh, so this child of mine, searching, 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 uh, they've now landed, and now they, they would say unequivocally, this has happened in the last six months, they are a child of Jesus. They are in church. They have found a church of their own that they can, they can, they can be a part of. It actually is pastored by one of my good friends. And uh, so they're getting theology every week. And you know what? I'm happy. And I could have put my foot down and I could say, now listen, you got to be with me, even though you're a young adult. I didn't do that. Now, I've made tons of mistakes as a parent. Uh, we don't have enough time here for me to tell you all the mistakes that I've made. But one thing I've learned is I'm not God. He is and God's got to call your children and grandchildren to him. You can't do it in God's behalf. When we step in in God's behalf, we screw it up. We mess it up. 
And uh, so I can say, you know, joyfully, I mean, I, I, I would do a handstand, but I'd hurt myself, all right? Um, both of my kids are, are in Christ, and they're walking with Christ, and they figured it out on their own. It's not mom and dad's faith anymore, it's theirs. So uh, that's our prayer for all the children of the church. We want them all to make decisions. We want them all to figure out faith on their own, not mom and dad saying, no, you're a Christian, Junior, just shake your head. Uh, that ain't going to last in life because they're going to get challenged. And uh, when they're challenged, their faith has to stand strong. So that's our prayer. So uh, how do you get there? I'm way off my notes. Who cares? Uh, do you all bring a lunch? All right, some of you are sipping coffee now, so you're good. All right, you're going to stay awake. Uh, how, how do we get there? First of all, Proverbs 1, the passage that Jaden read, at the end of, the, uh, end of that reading, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. There's lots about wisdom in here. There's lots about understanding. There's lots about discipline. But, but here's what verse 7 is really pointing to. This is my first point. Find the center of your family. You've got to find the center of your family. See, our universe has a lot of planets that are held together because there's a center. There's like a gravitational force that keeps it all in orbit. So similarly, uh, your family structure, the one you grew up in, the one you have now, uh, it has a center that everything orbits around. So let me give you some negative examples before I get to the positive. Uh, let's say the center of your family is school and education. Do you know what the priority is? Good grades. Uh, the child's got to get good grades. They've got to test well. They've got to get into a good college so they can have a good degree. Now, let me ask you this. Is it a sin to go to college? Is it? No, three students just said yes, all right? Um, <laughs> Don't listen to them right now, all right? It, it's, it's not a sin to go to college, but I'll tell you what is a sin, to make education the center of your home. That is a sin. For other people, uh, sports is the center of the family. The priority then becomes winning at all costs. And, uh, you know, I'm saying this with love because I, I've done this myself and I've seen the, the perils of it. Uh, when you put your kids into, like, select sports, uh, it's like a cult. Like I was part of that cult for a little while. Uh, why do I say it's a cult? Because they take all your money and control your entire life. <laughs> I kid you not. I mean, I traveled up and down the East Coast for a couple years, well, pretty much like 20-some weekends a year for my kid playing basketball. And, um, you know, they took, they took a lot of money. They controlled my life. But one thing they wouldn't do is they wouldn't affect my Sunday church attendance. Even though my kids played in travel sports, now I'm meddling a little bit. Even though my kids played in travel sports, uh, I made sure they were in church every Sunday. So if we had to miss a game to get there after church, we did it. And I was even the coach. So I had to get assistant coaches. I had to get them to cover for me because I wanted to make sure that God was first in our family. So sports can do that. Uh, it can become the center of a, of a home. Uh, what else? Money can be the center. Like, all the parents want is money, money, money. And so they're overextended at work, and they're, there's underparenting at home. There's uninvolvement. It can become the center. Uh, for some families, the center is fear. Maybe you were neglected as a child. You were mistreated. You were wounded. You have not recovered from that. You haven't gotten help from that. And the result is you have a lot of fears. And if fear is, is in there, the priority then becomes control, control. Like, you need to control everything and everyone and every outcome because I love and I protect everyone. Now, I'm telling you this as your pastor. You are not the sovereign God of the universe. You are not the God of even your little universe where you live. He is, and we need to learn to trust, and we need to look, look to him. But fear can be the center of the home. Another center of the home, it can be comfort and convenience where, like, everybody has their space, by that I mean like dad's got his man cave, dad's got his private room, nobody, nobody goes in there. Uh, dad comes home, plops down in his chair, watches TV, I'm in the man cave. The priority is comfort and leisure, but it's not Christ. Now even to this day, like uh, my kids, like some, sometimes they're adults, they know I study for sermons, 
uh, at the house. I have my own little study there. And they'll come up, and they'll, I hear them walking up the steps. And I'm like, oh, here they come. And uh, this happened like two weeks ago. And, uh, you know, I'm studying for a sermon. As soon as they walked in, like, I, I put my sermon aside to listen to them. I want them to know that they have that priority in my life, even as young adults. Now, if some of you try to interrupt me uh, during my sermon prep time, I'm going to dismiss your call. All right? When I see your call come through and I'm studying, it's decline. All right? Sorry. Love you. I'll call you later. But kids need to know that they're a priority. Um, what happens to other families is they don't have a plan. Uh, the center of their family is the latest crisis. Then the priority becomes drop everything and go deal with the crisis. Then the family's acting more like a fire department, like we wait for smoke and flames, then we go grab a hose and respond. Uh, for some of you, that's why you're exhausted and overwhelmed. For some of you, this is why you don't have a healthy family. It's not according to God's priority. It's according to the latest crisis. So what's my point? Every family has a center, and every family makes their decisions according to that center. Now, some of you are here, and you're single. What does this have to do with me? Well, I would say this. God should be the center of your life. He should be first place. Then you marry someone who's God-centered. Then you can make babies and have kids in an environment that's God-centered. That's what Proverbs 1 is saying. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Begin with God and then wisdom. That's what he's telling us. But, but here's the second thing I want to look at today. Your home is a school, and it's supposed to be a school of wisdom. Now, if you read through Proverbs 1, you're going to see lots of things about wisdom and prudence you're going to see lots of things about understanding and teaching shrewdness, all in those first seven verses. Uh, so some people will ask me, how should I educate my kids? Should I send them to public school? Should I send them to private school? Should I homeschool? Should I charter school? I would say, yes, they need to go to a school. But no matter where you send them to school, every Christian parent also homeschools. They also homeschool. What, what do I mean by that? They are with you more than they're with their teacher. They are with you every year. They change teachers, hopefully, every year. They might go to school and receive knowledge, but home needs to be a classroom. You know, many of us were raised uh, in a generation where a non-Christian psychologist dominated parental training and basically said, children are basically good you just need to give them a nourishing environment and build their self-esteem. And then they can realize the fullness of their greatness. And it didn't work. That's why we got a lot of selfishness and brokenness going on today. We have a lot of people who are, who are sinners, who, who need a Savior, who need wisdom. That We have rebels who need God. We have a lot of people with, with a high self-esteem but a painful life. And you know, our culture, our education system kind of dictates this. Our education system, nothing wrong with knowledge, but knowledge isn't an end of itself. There's lots of knowledge as we go to, to schools of higher learning. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting wisdom. You ever met some really smart person? Yeah, they really make bad decisions. Yeah, they got knowledge in a field, but they don't have wisdom. See, knowledge is truthful, wisdom is useful. Knowledge provides information, but wisdom provides transformation. That's the key. The goal is not information, but transformation, and that God would change the character of the person to be more like the character of Christ. So here's my question for you. If God is the center and wisdom is the priority, where do you get wisdom? We looked at this in week one. Let me just summarize for you. One place we get wisdom is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Holy Spirit. We need to stop sometimes and say, Holy Spirit, I need help. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. Holy Spirit, I'm teachable, I'm available, I want to be like Jesus. And I promise you this, if you will open yourself to the healing ministry of the Holy Spirit, you can overcome the pain of your past and he can architect for you a new future. So the Holy Spirit helps us get wisdom. Where else do we get wisdom? Like the Bible. The Bible helps us with wisdom. Prayer is, is, is giving us wisdom as well. Prayer, a lot of times we just think that it's how we talk to God. Um, what I would say to you is don't pray at the end when things are going awry. Pray at the beginning. Pray before the decisions are made. 
Pray before you have these things in your life that pop up. Counsel, getting around other wise people. So we, we have all these avenues to obtain wisdom. God, help me figure out my marriage, my kids. I have decisions to make. I welcome you. You get wisdom from godly counsel. So you might say, what does this look like? Well, I'm going to take you now and paint a case study for you from someone from, from the Bible, just for a minute or two. And, and it's, it's a, a young man by the name of Daniel. You know Daniel's story in the Bible, right? Um, for those of you that, that are parents or caregivers or grandparents, uh, Daniel is, is not perfect example, but he's wise. Uh, Daniel grows up in a very religious environment. Like he goes to church every Saturday night. That he has a diet that's committed to the Lord. He memorizes scripture. Everyone in this family all worships the same God. But, but he's a teenager, most likely, and what happens is he gets abducted and he gets taken to where? Who knows? Babylon, right. He, he gets taken to Babylon and, and it's rebellious. So if I can paint the picture for you, I want you to imagine a family that's very conservative. So they decide to move to the mountains of West Virginia and they go off the grid. No cell phone, no Wi-Fi, they homeschool, they have home church, and somebody kidnaps that kid and drops that kid off in the middle of Las Vegas. There they are with their straw hat and their corn cob pipe and their bib overalls, and they land in Vegas, and they're like, hee-haw, I'm in Vegas. Now, if this kid is like a 14 years old, and they get dropped off in the middle of Vegas, it's probably not going to end well. That's Daniel in Babylon. But it says that Daniel had wisdom, and he chose good friends, and when decisions need to be made, he made wise decisions. You and I need to understand this in our church and in our homes. We are raising children in Babylon. If we just leave the gravitational force of the universe to raise our children, that force will drag them down to hellish behavior. See, it takes wisdom to rise above the gravity of the culture in which we are raising children. Some people think, well, if I just get my kid in a good environment, let me tell you this, the most important environment is internal. Daniel had a bad external environment, but a good internal environment. That's so important to foster that in, in, in a home. Here's a third thing I want to get you. Now we're going to get back into Proverbs a little bit. Find the heart of parenting. Here's what Proverbs 4.23 says. Guard your heart above all else. It's the source of life. You know, the heart's mentioned over 900 times in the Bible. It's the center of who we are. It's where decisions are made. Words are spoken. Relationships are formed. Guard your heart. And I would say to those of you who are single, don't just give your heart Guard your heart. That's why people sometimes have heartbreak because they gave their heart when they should guard their heart because the Bible says it's the source of life. And if you want to make any headway in any relationship with your child, the issue is to get to the heart. Once you get the heart, the rest will sort itself out. Without the heart, nothing will sort itself out. So Pam and I like decided we were going to read a book when our kids were, we read a lot of books. You know, like, you know, we're readers, and we're like, we want to figure this out, and we read books, and we just ended up more confused than when we started. But one book that we read that we kind of sunk our teeth into was, was this book, Shepherding a Child's Heart by Ted Tripp. If you are a parent, I would highly encourage you to get this book. We read this book, we marked this book up, because we wanted to get, like, the hearts of our children because we knew the heart was the seat of everything. So, so we read this book multiple times. I've taught this book multiple times. Matter of fact, I was so like convicted by everything I read and I, I wanted to share it. I actually had Ted Tripp come to my previous church, the author, and he did like a six hour seminar on what it means to shepherd a child's heart. So I would encourage you to do that. But the, heart, the heart's where we gotta go. The heart's what we need to reach the kids at the church with. The heart's where you and I need to focus our attention on. And so, you know, I decided, you know, here I am raising two kids with Pam. I gotta get to their hearts. And so we spent a lot of time, like a lot of parents do, in the car. Like traveling to school, traveling to sporting events. And so I would ask them, 
when we were riding in the car, like tough life questions, like ultimate questions, like what do you think about this? What do you think about that? How does this fit with your view of God? How does this fit with, with, with a... Uh, with a God-sized view, with your Christian worldview, I was constantly asking them questions like that. Why? Because I wanted their heart. Now, they were probably rolling their eyes in the back seat, but you know, when they got through some of the struggles of life, as they got to grow older, I wonder how many of those conversations maybe had just a little, little impact on them. Maybe your parents did something like that with you grabbing the heart of a child. You know, one thing that I've noticed is the kids can reveal the heart of the parent as well. I want you to think about that. Your child reveals your heart because Jesus says this, out of the overflow of the heart, it comes out your mouth. So what does that mean? Like if you're raising your voice and screaming at your kids, that's a problem with your heart. If you're cursing at your kids, that's a problem with your heart. If you're name-calling and shaming your kids, that's a problem with your heart. So what does God need to do with the heart? You're like, yeah, I need to get my kid's heart, but guess what? God wants the parent's heart as well. He wants the caregiver's. He wants the grandparent's heart. He wants your heart as well. So that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came, he died, he was buried, he rose again. Why? To give us new hearts. See, we were born, Ezekiel tells us, with hearts of stone. We all had hearts of stone. Jesus came, and if you want to become a Christian, he's got to take out your heart of stone, and he's got to give you a heart of flesh. That's what Ezekiel says. And when Ezekiel mentions giving you a heart of flesh, then you're able to turn and put your trust in Christ. Then you're able to do things differently. You're able to be like Jesus. You're able to make changes. You're able to covenant with God. Maybe your child doesn't know Christ yet. So rather than just like yelling at their behavior, teach them to give their heart to Jesus. Provide opportunity for them to give heart, their heart to Christ. Now I want to talk about four kinds of kids real quick under this idea of the heart. Four kinds of kids. Uh, the first one I want to talk about, there's a kind of kid that has a bad heart and bad behavior. Now maybe you were this kid. Maybe you parent this kid. Um, here's how I describe this kid. This kid is basically a tiny terrorist. They would do more damage, but they don't have a driver's license and they're not six foot tall yet. All right, bad behavior. Parents say they have such good hearts. But yet, like when they're in children's ministry or they're in daycare, like they assault the other kids. Right? Like, if they were adults, they would be in prison, right? Um, I don't know this to be true. This is hypothetical. I'm not describing your kid over here, all right? If your kid's like that, bless those children's workers. But let's just say there's a kid with a truck, and they see another kid with a truck, but they want the other kid's truck. What are they, what are they gonna do, most likely? Yeah, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna make that kid cry. I'm gonna make that kid suffer. And parents sometimes will look at kids and they'll say something like this. They're like, uh, oh, but they have such a good heart. Um, no, they do not, Mrs. Bin Laden. Um, <laughs> that child is bad. That child is bad, all right? Um, so there's a kind of kid that has bad heart, bad behavior. There's another kind of kid that has a bad heart but good behavior. Maybe this was some of you. Maybe you're kind of self-righteous. You love to torment your siblings and manipulate your parents. And you did it with a smile. And you tell your parents, you know, Johnny, Johnny, he kind of got into the ice cream. And since I didn't do it, maybe you should discipline him and give me some ice cream. You are the sibling that tormented the other kid until they freak out and they get punished. He hit me. Yeah, but you've been poking him for the last seven days, right? So there's a kind of kid, bad heart, good behavior. Then there's also a good-hearted kid with bad behavior. Your kids are going to make mistakes. There's a difference between mistakes and sins. Religious parenting can't differentiate between a mistake and a sin. A mistake is you learn through trial and error. Now, let, let me give you this example. The first time you give your kid a cup that has no lid on it, what are they going to do with it? Yeah, they're going to spill it. They're learning how to hold it. They're going to make a mistake. 
You and I need to to know that God allows us as his children to make mistakes and he doesn't punish us. There's difference between a mistake and a sin. We learn through trial and error. Our children do the same thing. Sometimes a kid has a good heart and they just messed up trying to do the right thing. That's okay. And then there is the last kid, good heart, good behavior. Sometimes you get these windows where they love the Lord, they love others, you see evidence of the Holy Spirit, and you're like, that was a great three seconds. Um, I'm going to hold on to that for hope in the future. The behavior matters, but not as much as the heart. The heart matters. Grab your kid's heart. Let's grab the hearts. Let's capture the kid's hearts of the church. Sometimes that comes by God capturing our hearts. So now I want to just give you some practical tips for training real quick, and i got to hurry. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Start a youth out on his way, even when he's old, he will not depart. By the way, that's a principle, not a promise. Let me say some things about training. Some of you might like these, and some of you might not. So I'm going to have someone else close in prayer, I'm going to my car. Um, first of all, parents are primary. Praise God for teachers, children's ministry workers, coaches, but parents are primary. It's true. Here's a second tip I want to give you. Mom and dad need to have a unified vision. If mom and dad have two, division, two different visions, do you know what that is called? Division. Jesus says that a house divided falls down and can't stand up, which means mom and dad need to get on the same page privately before they present the decision publicly. I wonder how many of you grew up in a home where mom and dad didn't agree and you worked it. You know, dad, um, if I ask dad, it's always yes. If I ask mom, it's always no. So you're always playing like one against the other and it causes division. You need to be unified if you're going to train a child. Here's the third thing, and some of you are going to say amen. Training can be exhausting. Amen? Wow. You know why it's exhausting? Because class is always in session. You know, uh, kids have the biggest question at some of the least convenient times. It's Friday night. I tucked you in 27 times already. I, I, I read you the Jesus Storybook Bible. I cast a demon out of you. I just want to sit down and pray for the rapture so I could leave forever. Some of you are like, are you watching the security cameras at my house? Man, training children can be exhausting. So uh, there's a couple in our church. They talked to me this morning. They're getting ready to, to perhaps become foster parents. And I'm excited for them. Great joy. And they're like, what advice do you have about raising kids after that sermon? And I just started like laughing at them. I said, I'm sorry, man. You're going to enter into a whole new phase of life. And they're like, well, I'm anxious and you just increase my anxiety. I'm like, you're welcome. All right. I'll pray for you. But training training's exhausting. It's work. And, uh, but God has given Parents is the primary person to lead in that training. Here's another tip I want to give you. Emphasize delight over discipline. Look at Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. Do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son. Do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father disciplines his son in whom he delights. So let me say this. There are some parents, it's all discipline all the time. And some of your kids need some discipline, all right? I'm just saying, all right? But I want you also to know there's delight. And what some of you really need to do is you need to turn, like, the delight knob up, and you need to turn the discipline knob down. That's what you need to do. Why do I say that? Because delight is constant. Discipline is occasional. The point of life is to enjoy your kid. And together have hearts for the Lord. I'm not talking about a perfect family. My family is far from a perfect family. We've had many, many issues. And uh, if you speak to my daughter today, she will tell you all my problems. 
But what I'm talking about is a spirit-filled, wise, enjoyable family. Your kids, your grandkids, the people that you're caring for should know exactly how you feel about them. They should know you love them. They should know you like them. See, sometimes, homes, the only time parents talk to their children is when the kid's doing something wrong. It's just discipline, 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 no delight. That's how you break the heart of a child. God doesn't parent you like that. He delights in you. Some have said before you correct, you need to connect. Before you discipline the child, you need to delight in them. Sometimes I get called up to our school, the Christian Academy of Laurel, and usually when I get called up there, it's always bad. Like they never call up and say, hey, we're so glad you're here. We got some fudge sickles, and we just wanted to share one with you. That never happens, all right? Uh, It's bad. And so I have to go in to kids that I don't know very well, some of them middle schoolers, and I don't know them very well. And here I'm like 50, and they're like 11, and... uh, They want me to come in and kind of like be the hammer, and I'm like, I'm not doing that. I need to connect with them before I seek to give them instruction. So I try to talk to them. You know, what are you into? What video games do you like? What do you what 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 do you do for fun when you leave school? I mean, we have to learn to connect before we correct. We have to learn to delight before we discipline. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that God loves you? Amen? Do you believe that God likes you? What this verse is saying, God likes you because he delights to know you. He says, I delight being in your life. See, you don't rebel against a parent who delights in you nearly as frequently as a parent who only disciplines you. I think God, I think God likes me, not because I'm likable, obviously, but because that's his heart. And that's the heart we ought to have to children. Here's the last thing I want to say. I'm way over time. Who cares? Uh, Parenting is seasonal. Parenting is seasonal. What does this mean? Proverbs 31, 28 says this, her children rise up and call her blessed. Can I just ask you moms, does this happen early on? Like they're teething, they have diarrhea, they're throwing a fit at 3 a.m. in the morning, and you walk in the room and they say to you, there she is, my blessed mother. (laughs) Thank you for being the presence of God in my life. No, it takes time, doesn't it? It's seasonal. There's a lot of praying and watering and pruning and weed pulling, and eventually you'll eat the fruit of the harvest. Where one day maybe they'll say, Mom, thanks. Thanks for staying at home. Thanks for driving me to all those practices and recitals. Thanks for helping me with my homework. Thanks for all the good meals. All the things they're fighting you on when they get older and grow in wisdom, they're going to thank you for because you parented them. I got one more verse. I made all the parents cry. Now I'm going to make all the grandparents cry. Proverbs 17 and verse 6. Grandchildren are the crown of the elderly, and the pride of children is their fathers. Can I just ask you, how many of you are grandparents? Would you raise your hand? All right, lots of you. Um, how do you feel about your grandkids? Like, talk to me. How do you feel? They're what? How are they? Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. How are your grandkids? They're fun. Of course they're fun because you get to feed them and send them home, right? (laughs) That's fun, right? You get to play with them and get them all wound up and, you know, give them sugar and then hand them back to their parents. And uh, you get to do things. You don't have to pay for everything. It's fun. Um, But you know, how you raise your kids is going to determine how you're going to experience your grandkids. Here's what's shocking is in this verse. I want you to look at it closely. Parents 
are the pride of their children. God says, if the Spirit is present and people are walking in wisdom, there will come a day when the grandparents are like, we love those grandkids. And the children will look to their parents one day and say, you're amazing. I thank God for you. See, God wants children to be as excited for their parents as grandparents are excited for their grandchildren. This doesn't happen by itself. It takes a miracle. This doesn't happen perfectly, but this, this, this does happen possibly. But everyone is going to need to walk in wisdom. Now, I figured out as I was preparing for this message that, that one day, far, far, far away, far away, Pam and I are going to be great-grandparents. But to get there, I need to raise my kids that they feel about me what one day I'll feel about their kids. That's on me as a parent. Parenting is seasonal, meaning that the way I interact with my kids as toddlers and teens isn't the way I need to act with them when they're young adults moving into adulthood. And this is part of the problem the conflict between parents and children is the parent and the child have not agreed that they are moving into the next season of parenting. I don't parent my kids who are in their 20s the way I did when they were 12. Things change. You know, you might say, Mom, you know, that was fine when I was three, but now I'm 33. I can eat a sandwich with a crust on it, and it's not going to hurt me. Um, there are seasons of parenting. There's supposed to be nine seasons I read about this week. I am between season eight and nine. Like my, I'm about ready to move into the last phase of parenting. And let me say this. Every season is wonderful. You know, sometimes we look back when they were little and we say, man, I miss those little years. Well, I'll say I love those years, but I also love these years. They're all amazing. They're all gifts. So friends, parenting isn't about getting it right. It's about being humble. It's about walking in wisdom and the grace of God making it right even when you got it wrong. See, our lives need to be God-centered and they need to be wisdom prioritized. So parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, caregivers, man, capture the heart of your children. Because God, he wants to capture our hearts first. Amen? Man, may God give us grace. I just want to tell you, you know, I've blown it as a parent. I've blown it sometimes. But God's given grace. And God can give you grace too. He can help you. 